the 4-3-3 is by far the most popular formation in the modern game. From Premier League winners Manchester City to Champions League finalists Liverpool and Real Madrid, it's been the most used formation for nearly two decades. So how exactly do you stop it? And will any formation eventually steal its crown? Well, in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at how to counter the 4-3-3. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Football Meta. And if you want to see more tactical breakdowns, then please leave a like and subscribe for more. Before we get going, it's important to note that no two teams are ever the same. And even if they play with the same formation, managers and players will mean each team has their own unique style of play. For example, Klopp and Guardiola both use the 4-3-3. However, both managers have very different philosophies. Now, if you want to know more about the 4-3-3, then check out this video for an in-depth description. But for anyone who's already seen it, here's a quick rundown of its main strengths and weaknesses. The 4-3-3 gives a team excellent offensive and defensive balance. The natural shape means the team can quickly cover the pitch both vertically and horizontally. And players who receive the ball will almost always have at least two passing options given the triangular shape between positions. It has great central cover and can quickly have a lot of players on the attack. With the fullbacks pushing up, the two box-to-box -box midfielders as support and with a back three defensive unit to stop any counters. Without possession, it's the go-to formation for high-pressing teams, as it can quickly cover passing lanes and have players ready to double up on the player in possession. Now, on the flip side of the coin, the aggressive nature of this formation means it can struggle against quick counter-attacks, especially on the flanks in pockets of space behind the fullbacks. It's also a formation that requires constant movement to provide passing options, and can often struggle to break down a low defensive block. While it has great central cover, the flanks are, generally speaking, the most exposed areas of the pitch and requires the attacking players to help out defensively consistently throughout the match. The basic structure but complex rotations of the 4-3-3 means it's an extremely difficult formation to master and requires the right players for the job. So with that out of the way, how exactly do you stop one of the most successful formations in football history? Well, let's start by taking a look at what to do when in possession. The first thing to consider is the choice of formation. No one formation will always win against another, and it always depends on players and the tactical choice by managers. Nonetheless, by understanding the weaknesses of the 4-3-3, we can choose a formation accordingly. The key area for the 4-3-3 is the midfield. These three players are what bring balance to the team, assisting defense and attack throughout the match. A perfect example is Real Madrid's Casemiro, Cruz and Modric. The fullbacks are also crucial to the team's offensive success, so it's important to also choose a formation that could make their job harder during the 90 minutes. This leaves us with two choices to make. Firstly, you could choose to overload the midfield, outnumbering the midfield three and leaving the flanks free for the fullbacks to be in a 1v1. Formations such as the 4-4-2 diamond could quickly gain control of the center. Alternatively, the magic box of the 4-2-2-2 could leave the midfield in two minds having to cover the players staggered between the lines. These formations are also great as it keeps the centre-backs occupied with two strikers. The only downside is that it can't easily exploit spaces out wide, as the fullbacks are needed during build-up to outnumber the front three. However, if the team can quickly bypass the front block, then it can swiftly get the upper hand and outnumber the opposition's defensive block. I would recommend these formations only if you know your fullbacks are up to the task and are, generally speaking, better than the opposition's fullbacks. The second choice, and the more common of the two, is to completely vacate the centre of the pitch. Rather than trying to play the 4-3-3 at its own game, managers have found that the best way of getting past the midfield is to play around it. A formation such as the 3-4-3 takes full advantage of the space out wide, thanks to three players on each flank, with support in the centre if needed. The tricky part will be beating the high press, as it will be a 3v3 situation in the first phase, and so a goalkeeper who is excellent with his feet is also a requirement as this allows the team to outnumber the front block. As the 4-3-3 is a formation that works very well in a high press given the three offensive players, it can at times be exposed to a chip ball into the wingbacks out wide to start their attack. With the wingers playing high and wide, pinning the opposition's fullbacks, it means the wingback can receive the ball with little pressure. If the midfield rotates to cover, then the wingback on the opposite flank will be completely free to receive the ball. Thomas Tuchel demonstrated this brilliantly both in his time with PSG and Chelsea when facing a 4-3-3. While there are two midfield pivots, one would usually push up past the midfield three, transforming the formation into more of a 3-3-4 or 3-3-2-2, completely vacating the centre and preferring to overload space out wide. 
With the ball moving over to the wing back, the front four could rotate, drop into the centre and quickly outnumber the midfield on the flank, while also having the option of rotating to the other wing to exploit the extra space. In fact, switching play is also another excellent way of bypassing the 4-3-3. Given that the three midfielders will often stay in close proximity to close off the centre, it means the opposite flank can be exposed to switches in play. It's something Real Madrid did exceptionally well against Liverpool in the Champions League final. While it was a 4-3-3 on paper, the formation was arguably more of a 3-3-4, with Carvajal pushing up on the right, and Real looking to switch play into Vinicius who would pick up pockets of space behind Trent who'd pushed up to support the attack, or switching from left to right for Valverde and Carvajal to be in a 2v1 against Robertson. So generally speaking, a team will want to exploit the space out wide to bypass the 4-3-3's central block. The tricky part is beating the high press and so a keeper with great distribution will certainly help out in this department, able to pick out players beyond the first line of pressure. Now, in the final third, it's the flanks again that hold the key to success. When defending deep, the 4-3-3 will often transition into a 4-5-1 defensive shape, with the wingers dropping either side of the three midfielders. The most effective way of creating an opportunity is to move the ball quickly into the final third, and not allow the opposition to get into position. As soon as the midfield line is broken, it's important to attack the space behind the back line, or to quickly move the ball out wide for a 1v1 where the winger can cut inside and shoot, or look for the striker and winger on the opposite flank. If the opposition is able to get back into position, it's important to commit a lot of players to the attack. A formation such as the 3-4-3 would allow you to have 5 players on the defensive line, with good central cover to rotate the ball, and 3 defenders ready to stop any counters. But two striker systems are also extremely dangerous against the 4-3-3 once they bypass the midfield. Having two strikers means one can constantly attack the space in behind, while one comes short to collect, meaning the defensive line can often find itself leaving gaps, usually for the attacking mid to move into. By overloading the defensive line, it allows you to have players staggered in the half spaces, which creates danger for the opposition, given that trying to cover this space could leave gaps down the middle or out wide. What's important is to hold as much width as possible, forcing the back line to stretch to cover all the attacking players, subsequently leaving more gaps between the four defenders. For example, let's say the left wing back is in possession, and the winger is in the half space with the striker between the centre backs. The winger can attack the space in between the full back and the centre back. If he's followed by the centre back, then channels open up centrally for the striker. If the full back steps back to cover, then the wing back can attack centrally. Given the central block, it will take some patience for gaps to open up, but by holding the width and rotating from side to side, eventually gaps will come. Again, in these half spaces where players can cut in behind and deliver a ball into the area of maximum opportunity. Overall, the 4-3-3 has great central cover. However, it can be exposed with quick constant movement, overloading the flanks and players constantly attacking the space behind the back line. Now, when playing against the 4-3-3, chances are you're going to have to defend for large parts of the match. So let's take a look at what to do when out of possession. One of the main strengths of the 4-3-3 is how quickly it can rotate to outnumber a team's high press. For example, the holding mid could drop deep to form a back three and have the fullbacks push up. Or the three midfielders can rotate to form a double pivot to help the team build centrally. To counter this, it does require an extremely organised high press, with players ready to set up pressing traps to trick the opponent. Two striker systems such as the 4-4-2 diamond could work well. The strikers could close down the centre backs, with the four midfielders staying tight to force play out wide. Having the extra man in midfield means the left centre mid can close down the fullback, with the attacking mid dropping deep to cover, keeping a numerical parity in the centre and forcing the fullback into a tough spot, with the striker blocking any reverse passes. Alternatively, this formation would work even better if forcing the 4-3-3 to play centrally. The strikers could start either side of the centre-backs, blocking off a pass into the fullback and forcing the first pass into the holding mid, where now the team can commit to a press knowing they can't easily be outnumbered in the centre. The only risk when using the 4-4-2 diamond is if the team is slow to close down the fullback, as if he's not closed down quickly enough, it could create a 2v1 situation against your fullback. Alternatively, back three formations also work well in the first press. Rather than wanting to force play down the center where they would be outnumbered, the front three should look to force play out wide, where the wing backs can help double up on the full backs and close the space near the touchline. If the opposition is able to bypass the press and reaches the final third, then you'll need to have enough cover out wide to stop these triangles, 
and have players occupying the half spaces where the wingers or midfielders will often look to move into. Now, given how offensive the 4-3-3 can often end up, it's important to always keep an outlet option out wide to immediately hit them on the counter-attack. If possession is regained, having players in these pockets of space behind the fullback means you can immediately create a dangerous opportunity, while also forcing the 4-3-3 to commit less players to the attack, directly limiting their attacking power. Beating the 4-3-3 is no easy task, but with excellent organisation and quick movement it can be just as vulnerable as any other formation. Now if you want to see more of these videos then let me know what formation we should cover next. Make sure to follow me on Instagram for daily tactics videos to keep your football knowledge up to date. As always if you enjoyed this content then please let me know by leaving a like and subscribing for more. Thanks for watching.